Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> you look like George Costanza. I'm feeling like him. I don't mind early mornings, but right now I've been probably taking that back. You two are the ones who are like brazenly like, oh, I'm up in the morning. I'm going. I've done three thesis, thesi. I've uh, raised seven kids. Ryan's a piece of shit for liking to sleep in. I love mornings. And I'm I'm here at my door opening it up, offering you coffee, just barely grumbling in. Actually, you, you, Brad, to your credit, you're not bad. Evan, you look like you're in disrepair. <laughs> Yeah, I was not prepared. I thought I was good for this. I was not. <laughs> um, Evan's wearing his loudest coat this episode, but I'm actually not concerned because he's not moving much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to move as little things as possible. We um, we sometimes have episodes where, you know, it's late or it's, and then uh, we just kind of go off. We swear more than we should that episode, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we joke that it's Winged Wheel Podcast after dark. What is it when we record early? Before dark? Wait, no, no. it's still dark. Yeah. Before light? Before light, yeah. Yeah. Somehow more PG, this show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Uh, talking to you bright and early. We are mere hours after Lucas Raymond's overtime winner. Uh, and that is all the fuel I need to wake up. I'm Ryan Hanna. It's too early for anything. Clever on Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. Uh, on this episode of the Wind Wheel Podcast, we are going to be talking about the Detroit Red Wings' uh, most recent game. Uh, we're going to be talking about different line combinations that we've seen come out and uh, what's next for um, players. Maybe not in the doghouse, but uh, whatever Zadina is in right now. Uh, we'll be talking about some stuff around the league. Brendan and Lemieux bit a guy. <laughs> <laughs> For those wondering, yes, that's Claude's son. Yeah. Uh, Artemi Panarin got fined for throwing his glove. and It was a maximum allowable fine, which begs the question, should he have thrown both gloves? Would he have got double the fine? Or I think would it, it would have been, been the, the same, same fine. Yeah, I think it would have been the same price. So Artemi, inefficient investor, more at 11. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, whatever else comes up on this episode of the Wind Wheel podcast. Uh, but first... The Jamie Daniels Foundation. Uh, it's an organization we're very, very proud to partner with. Um, it is founded uh, by Jamie's father and Red Wings lead announcer Ken Daniels and Jamie's mother, uh, or Jamie Daniels' mother, Lisa Daniels Goldman. Um, they strive to end the stigma of substance use disorder and provide support to those struggling with the disease or who are in recovery. To learn more and offer your support, visit jamiedanielsfoundation.org. And in case you didn't know, uh, something that this podcast is doing in partnership with uh, Prashant Iyer is uh, we've started the Wings Money on the Board campaign, which is a way for you to um, make a pledge based on Red Wings hockey. It could be anything from Lucas Raymond points to amount of times Michael Rasmussen um, kills falls. an off kills an offensive rush. Yeah, wh whatever you want to do, <laughs> and you pledge a certain amount of money twenty five cents, twenty five dollars, twenty five thousand dollars, whatever you want it to be uh, over the course of the season, and then you donate that money, and then you also can win cool stuff and giveaways. There's one off special events, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, just as a quick update. We have created a Just Giving page uh, for Wings Money on the Board. Uh, so we worked with um, the Jamie Daniels Foundation to do this. So it's justgiving.com slash wings money on the board, uh, all one word. Go there, and when you make your donations or your, for your pledges, uh, that's where you put it in. And it just helps us track how much money uh, you lovely people have raised. All right. The Red Wings. Uh, Evan is going to give you a five-minute unabridged synopsis of the game starting. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. I'll be doing that. That game was um it had all the makings of a snooze fest, especially to start, which was dangerous because I had a nap before that game, so I was like, oh, I might not make it through this. <laughs> but it wasn't by virtue of the Red Wings being bad, I want to say that. They I think were the better team the whole game. It's they're playing Buffalo, it's not saying much, but that statement is correct. Yeah. It was um 
full of missed chances, missed opportunities, and not just from like, you know, Zadina or Rasmussen or whoever uh, this week's punching bag is. And yes, that is a slight on ourselves. Um, but it was like Tyler Bertuzzi. <laughs> Did you see the two on one where Tyler Bertuzzi, the pass came in a little too hot and it went right past him. And he tried, he tried his damnedest to get that thing and somehow ended up doing a somersault and a backflip and a barrel roll all at once and crashed into the boards. So I'm like, oh, he's dead. Tyler yeah. Bertuzzi just died for sure. Broke everything in his body. But of course, he's made of adamantium and got up and just started, kept playing. Yeah, that was one of uh, like nine scoring chances he missed last night. But in the end, they came through without uh, the, or not without the usual Red Wings um, MO in the third period, though. Just what even is an insurance goal? I don't understand. <laughs> I think we're we're skipping past the whole game here, but just to talk about the third period, it's to the point where everyone is watching it happen. The Red Wings have a lead of any amount in the third period, often just one goal because it's the Red Wings. Um, Let me guess who was out there. Are their initials M R S G A E? No. Well, yeah. Yeah. Were they out? I don't know. It was like two minutes left in the game. It doesn't. Oh, that's a high probability then. <laughs> well, it's, it's not really about who's out there. It's just what they do when they're on the ice. Like it's the whole period. They just seem disinterested and really pushing for that goal. And in a game where through pretty much every single segment of the game, you had an opportunity to get in there and drive those offensive chances. It doesn't matter that you weren't converting. Offense is the best defense or something like that. I don't know. Some dummies who can actually score said that. That's not me, but <laughs> it is getting tiresome to watch. When Brad has been saying it and then I start saying it, you know, it's it's a little bit. Ugh. It's a little bit of a thing. Yeah, even Ryan's caught up on this one. Um, what is it? Yeah, it's a lot easier to not get scored on when you have the puck. Hey, listen, weird shit's happened in hockey. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying your odds go way up. Substantially. Yeah. So, you know, and if you get that insurance goal, hey, you can afford to cough one up into your own net. So it's win win, really, um, which would ultimately lead to, you know, a win. <laughs> so, yeah, I I don't know if this is just a coach thing, a strategy thing or a player mindset thing. I've been really trying to pay attention to what the Red Wings pressure system is when it gets to the third period. But it's so bad to the point that they have the puck so little in these third periods that I can't even really watch their forecheck consistently enough to break down what they're doing with any regularity. Cause obviously with hockey is a game of reaction. So, you know, most breakouts aren't going to be exactly as the coach wants it because something on the ice isn't where it's supposed to be. So you need a good sample size to be able to figure out, are they still running their high pressure forecheck? Are they just sitting back and running a two, three, a three, two, or are they going one, two, 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 one, two? I don't know. I don't know. They have the puck so goddamn little in the third period. I don't know. Yeah, and it doesn't matter who they're playing. They could be playing, you know, the Stanley Cup champion Tampa Bay Lightning at their peak or Evan's Beer League team with Evan looking like this on the ice, and they'll still sit back and let the game come to them. It's a dangerous game to play. It is. Especially when Evan might actually be able to skate tonight. Yes. I thought there was going to be a joke inserted there when we talked about Tyler Bertuzzi doing uh, (laughs) going headfirst into the boards. (laughs) Uh, that joke. that should have been me on, oh, those, I was say, on those skates. Joke. Oh yeah, it's, it's rude to call them skates. <laughs> you got your skates fixed? Uh, what? Yes, yes. It's, of Brad. it's my best work. I threw. The, I was curious because I'm like, these feel ridiculously sharp, but you can't eyeball what a sharpen is. But I'm like, whatever Evan usually gets, this definitely isn't it. But even with the naked eye, I'm like, these don't look close to level. So I threw a level on them, and it was like this. It would be graded a blue if you went skiing. <laughs> That's how steep it was. <laughs> it's a joke for wealthy people on this podcast. <laughs> um, yeah, Evans. Evan had a brought his skates to I don't know who, but they just I think ran it across some coarse limestone, <laughs> and they had to be repaired. And like we mentioned last episode, we hit stop on the recording when we went, Brad, please help with our hockey equipment. <laughs> please, Brad. 
Yeah, I, I, what was the message I sent in the group chat? I'm like, Evan, if you can skate on these, this is the best work I've ever done. I'll submit it for a peace, a Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah, prize and signs. You really shouldn't have, Brad. You, you should have told him you repaired it and made it so that he absolutely fell over. I don't know how you would have done this, but after 10 minutes on the ice, just have him stumble and just start falling. I'll do that I'll myself. Don't yeah. worry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hey, he wanted to try the new Sharpen today. That's a little duller for a bit more glide. This could go poorly for him still. Don't that is, uh, that is a good beer league thing, though. More glide. Yeah, make yeah. sure. Make it, <laughs> <laughs> that is the ultimate beer league move. There yeah. is no back check, baby. Um, all right. The ultimate result of the game, the Red Wings with a 3-2 overtime win uh, on uh, over Buffalo. Let's talk about the Lucas Raymond goal. What's What was the kicking and screaming? Pass it to the Italians. That movie, Do you, the Will Ferrell movie. Have you, have you, not you got it? anything here? Because this I got, is way too early for me. Yeah, I got uh, oh, it. Will Ferrell movie. Okay, that limits it down to what six hundred films. This is since okay. like two thousand eight. Kicking yeah. and Screaming is a great film, though. I've not seen that. that one. Kicking and Screaming cannot be too deep of a cut for this podcast. Okay, this is the first time hearing of this movie. What? Anyways, how old is it? Like, is this recent? Like, should I have heard of it? Or is this like so old that it could have just been pushed out of my memory? Oh my God. It came out in 2005. Well, they, uh, that's why. Yeah. Can, wow. can I inject one more tangent into this conversation? Yeah, man, go for it. Well, who's going to stop me? <laughs> <laughs> Not either. Um, so we, we, when, like, we've been on this binge of watching like old movies, mm -hmm. just like for whatever reason, no reason at all. And last night we put on the Mighty Ducks. I've got to take that that movie is actually terrible. Oh, yeah. It's, it does not hold up at all. I, we, I, D2 I, does? Uh, D, no. I've never seen so many children without helmets in a hockey game and so much violence for eight-year-olds. <laughs> anyway. I thought you were saying it doesn't hold up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Catherine was like, when's the animation start? I was like, what are you talking about? Oh, she thought it was. Yeah, uh, she's like, like where's Goofy in? in? Oh, I was like, no. I was like, Cat. I was like, have you seen this movie? She's like. <laughs> Yes. I was like, no, you haven't. No. Anyways, that was the first time she's watched The Mighty Ducks. And are we going to just let that movie slide by calling the triple, like the triple deke, the kid stick handles three times and takes a slap shot. There's there's you, no deke there. You have to come into that movie knowing that there is absolutely no realistic hockey play at all. It's like they pass the puck and then they cut to that action shot of the puck where it's going. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. There was a lot of whooshing. Yeah. Like when they skate by people, it's like. Whoosh. Yeah. It's the sound effects Brad makes when he's playing. Yeah. But, they but I make the them whole... with my mouth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, not great. That did not age well. It holds up. It's the spirit of the thing that holds up. D2 is definitely better. I agree. And D3 is probably the most realistic, if we're being honest. Yeah. Although, some... you know, a team that wins the Junior Olympics can barely hack it in, like, varsity hockey. <laughs> For some reason, their goalie didn't have pads and one player was wearing a football helmet. Yeah. Very confusing. And the arena was packed. Like, I was like, what 10-year-old game is jammed packed? We, we should have known, like, in the very first scene, like, their first practice was it's on that literal door. pond. <laughs> yeah. Like, that doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And Emilio Estevez drives a limo out onto the pond. I was like, I don't know if this movie is as good as I remember. Like, yeah, it's, like, he almost recreated the, the Titanic. <laughs> yeah. Like, I know Philly's not the warmest city in the world, but it's also not the coldest city in the world. So I'm not testing that pond. Philly gets cold. It's cold, but like Kitchener gets colder than Philly. You driving a limo out into a pond around here? Emilio Estevez is. Oh, well, I mean, back when they made that movie, it was probably colder. Uh, very true. Yeah. Hey, hot takery here. I don't want that conversation in our nah, just, <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. It's it's harder and harder to build a backyard rink every year, which in a sick way I'm almost grateful for because I'm never interested in like getting up. I like whatever unholy hour and, and hosing down the pond or the the backyard rink. Yeah, I would build one if I literally didn't live across the street from a community center. Anyways. Sorry. Oh, that's Not okay. Bad. I thought that was too funny to pass up. Now that we've talked about Lucas Raymond's origin story. Yeah. I will say that the, I, I will have the same affections for, for the Mighty Ducks movie, well, knowing how bad it I'll is. I'll go through number two and three and bring yeah. my analysis for next week. Actually, for whatever it's worth, me uh, and me are like seven episodes into the Mighty Ducks reboot. It's not bad, actually. Huh. Yeah, it's not bad. Like, it's it's over-the-top cheesy like you would expect, like a Mighty Ducks. But yeah, it's, it's at least like if you got a kid around, it's worth the watch. Um, the Are those my socks? 
do you shop at Costco? Yeah, okay, that makes sense. And yes, they yeah. are your socks. <laughs> <laughs> Lucas Raymond, overtime winner after a snooze fest of a game. And my reference to kicking and screaming was just past the gist of it is they get some Italian kids who are unreal at soccer and uh, they pretty much just yell at pass to the Italians all the time. Should we just be saying pass to Lucas Raymond the moment he's on the ice in overtime? Because it seemed automatic. The moment it was on a stick, you were like, mm, yeah, something's happening here. Here's a potential for a game winner right there. Walk us through that goal. Um, I don't really need to because we detailed it in great detail. Last episode, he just did it again, where he comes down and lets go what looks like a fairly harmless shot. This time he had a defenseman between him and the goalie, where he changed the angle just enough so that when the goalie started leaning on his right leg and there was that triangle under his left pad, he hit it in that same spot again. Like... I mean, I know Mick, after the game, was talking about, like, oh, that was a bit of a, that goal was a bit of a sieve. No. Lucas Raymond knew exactly what he was doing there. He, he planned for that to happen. It's one thing to shoot a puck and pick the open spot of the net and, hey, it goes in. You, you hit the spot. But most NHL goalies are good enough that, you know, there's not too many dead zones in the net like that. So Lucas Raymond's just like, no, I'm going to make the spot mm -hmm. and then hit it. Obviously, having a defenseman there to kind of act as a quasi screen helps. But again, don't think he didn't plan that. It's just, it's remarkable. Like I said last episode, it's the thing that separates the good players from the great players. For a guy who thought his shot wasn't really good enough for the NHL and then worked really hard on it in the offseason before his last season in the SHL, that has just paid dividends in so many ways. Because if, if we had a Lucas Raymond who wasn't confident in his ability to score like that, to shoot it like that, um, he would have tried to have gone around that defender and who's to say he couldn't but it's a much more low percentage play right in the nhl you see rookies try to do it a lot and it might work one or work once or twice but the moment teams start game planning against those star rookies then it stops happening um but like you said lucas raymond now confident in his shot and knows that he can score like that changes the angle uses the defender as a screen which i actually think was more of the primary function of pulling the puck in. well let's say equal parts and it doesn't matter if it was like the puck fluttered at all or Tokarski should have had it like Lucas Raymond made all those adjustments that deception that we talked about last episode and that's why it went in that's the difference maker right there you you can talk about one or two crazy goals that a, a rookie or a young guy had on a team and you remember it all season the reason we're talking about you know points 21 plus for Lucas Raymond right now is because he does that stuff all the time. All the time. Also, great goal call, by the way. Oh, yeah. That was, I could have stayed up for another 10 hours after that goal. Oh, yeah. You would have been 100%. just in time for the podcast to start. Yeah. Well, I you actually would have been late by a few hours, probably. Yeah, that's actually true. I did. Okay, I'll admit it. I pulled up an all-nighter. I just uh, was watching the goal on repeat the whole night. Well, that's what all the good shooters are doing now. Like... What, uh, let's think of the, like the Ovechkin Stamkos. I'll call it an era. Those guys have wicked releases, incredible velocity, and they just can brute force through the goalies um, and and pick corners. Like, but now the the modern shooter is changing the angles. Like, let's the most obvious example is an Austin Matthews. Like his release is incredible. He he's got the accuracy, but he can create more opportunity for himself because he changes the angle it, like a small toe drag changes it and it, it the goalie is not set and um lucas raymond kind of does that he did it last night and he's done it in a few of his goals where it's just a little change and it's just a and just enough to make the goalie have to move and at that point it's too late so uh you know this is an episode by episode topic at this point but lucas raymond continues to lead the Calder race, but Mort Sider also didn't have a nothing game, uh, played very well altogether, all things considered, and was rewarded with an uh, assist on the Pew Suter goal. So it's not always um, highlight real goals and absolutely dazzling. And, you know, that one clip that everyone's talking about forever and ever, it's they're just doing it night in and night out. And this is for Sider, who by all rights and his standards has had a, a quiet couple of games here. 
and here we are. Both of them contributed. What a time to be alive. I saw a graphic that it was um, points by rookies across all NHL teams. So um, I forget who it was. I want to say it was Winnipeg or something was in dead last with like one or zero. Mm -hmm. The Red Wings were in first uh, with like 36. And then it's crazy to think that like three of those points were contributed by Valeno and the rest is just Raymond Insider. There was a, it, it was, I think the NHL PR account put out like points by guys 25 years old and younger. It was like 110 or something. I'm like, that cannot be right. That can absolutely not be right. There's no way that if you add up all the Red Wings point totals, you get anywhere near that. I have to find it. I might be butchering it. Wait, but. for the, just for the Red Wings? Yeah. Oh, shit. That is crazy. Yeah. Because, yeah, Larkin's 25, so. Oh. Is Larkin 25? I thought he was 26. I thought he was 25. You're almost definitely right, and you are. He's 25 years old. Um, the <laughs> the Phillips Zadina goal that was not to be. Um, that one made sense. It eventually was re- re- um, changed to Carter Rowney, assisted by Lindstrom and Gagne. Much like the Zadina assist that he got the other game, where I think he actually did assist in that play, if you consider like hockey context. But did he actually touch the puck? Eh. Maybe not. This one, he actually didn't hit the puck. And it looked like he was looking at Lindstrom right after for the celebration. Um, <laughs> but for a night where he was moved down to a fourth line and it was also his birthday, you were like, kind of hope that one. That's an, actually an improvement from Jeff Blashell. I'm surprised he didn't get scratched for his birthday. Yeah, for real. Just wait to the bobblehead night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I hate that meme so much. Um that's okay. Did you hear what? Uh, who was it? Rick Bonus. Da- was Rick it? Bonus. Yeah, what he did to oh. Riley Tufty. Oh yeah. Like literally, his his first game in his home ta- hometown in Minnesota, home state of Minnesota. Literally bought so many tickets for his friends and family that he was actually playing the game for free. And somebody and then get- else, uh, uh, someone else on the team chipped in to buy tickets yeah, yeah. like their tick their allotment of tickets yeah. and i think i want to say a dude on minnesota that he knows did as well like hey tufty ran out of money to be able to buy it yeah yeah when you get called up you only get so much cash for that yeah day. yeah and then bonus scratches him an hour before the game like I, I okay i'm not the pettiest person in the world and i don't generally hold grudges but if i was riley tufty i am walking into bonuses or the gm's office immediately after that game and going trade me tomorrow I don't care where. Well, I mean, no, he wants a career in the NHL. Well, it's a bad look, like, also <laughs> like, for the players on the team who are their captains. Like, you yeah. look at the board, and you know this guy was going around getting tickets for yeah. his family. You walk into your coach's office and be like, this guy's playing. Oh, wait, you mean Jamie Ben's not a great, the greatest person ever? Hmm, shocking. Weird. Yeah. Never would have guessed. Apparently, um, Apparently, bonus was like, I came to the rink and the decision was already made, like assistant coaches or whoever. And certain guys who were hurt were available when they weren't expecting it. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all a very good excuse. But you're the head coach. <laughs> the head coach. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know how this could have happened. Who would, um, who made this decision? Who has the authority to, to really <laughs> change this? Anyways, this isn't commentary on Jeff Blashell. It's just, um, yeah, an interjection here of, uh, it's at least nice to know that it's not just the Red Wings that this happens. Yeah. Or Mike Babcock teams, but which, you know, is also a Red, Red Wings thing, I guess. It's suppose. not just Mike Babcock and Mike Babcock disciples. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that goal got changed away from Zadina, and it made sense. But let's talk about Zadina on the fourth line at all. So the lines came out. and it's, Can we not? It's too early for this. And essentially, uh, it was just a second and fourth line swap. So Zadina... Bumped down to the fourth line, playing with Rowney and Gagne, and uh, Giovanni Smith jumped up to the second line. The third line stayed as is. Although I will say, you know, that's how they are on the depth chart, one, two, three, four. But Zadina, uh, Gagne, and Rowney played more like third line minutes. They actually played, I'm pretty sure, more than the second line overall. I mean, they scored too, but so did the second line. So the third line was the only line that didn't score. Fun. Yeah. We've talked before about the concept of changing lines, and even though things were going well, pucks need to be in the net at some point. So you can play all the great hockey that you you need to, but if your line isn't producing, that's more than just causing my mind to, to split up those lines. So I wasn't irate about it, but just kind of want to get general thoughts overall. Was this a move to get Zadina going? Was this a, we just need more hard hitting on the second line? Whatever it is. This was a message to Zadina. 
plain and simple, because they replaced him on the second line with Giovanni Smith. Giovanni, who has been a routine healthy scratch over the last month. So clearly Blashill's not enamored with Giovanni Smith's play this year, or else he'd be an every nighter. Um, let's be call space space. Giovanni Smith isn't that good by NHL standards, and you're throwing him on the second line. He's not a second line good. You can slot no. him in as your 12th, 13th forward just fine. Yeah, yeah. He can play in an NHL roster. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying send the guy to Grand Rapids, but um, he's not a second liner. Um, we know Blashill loves that third line for God knows whatever reason, so they weren't getting split up. So I understand why it was Giovanni Smith going up, um, but the whole reason for the move was to bump Zadina down because this wasn't a move made with Giovanni Smith in mind. This is a move made with Philip Zadina in mind, Yeah, which, you know, there's two sides to this coin. One, yeah, Zadina needs to produce. We've been on his case about that. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Like, dude, you got to score eventually. Um, But at the same time, it can't be a commentary on his play because he hasn't been bad. Bra- Blasio preaches the 200-foot game, and Zadina's all about it. Zadina creates chances. We've, I'm not going to get into that again. Zadina's playing well. He just can't finish. It's it's that simple. So I don't know if Blashill's like, you score a goddamn goal or you're never leaving this line, or if there's something he's seeing that we're not. I don't know. But, yeah, this was this was a message to Zadina. One way or, or whatever. I shouldn't say one way or another. Whatever it might be. I saw it on paper, and I was like, okay, yeah, message to Zadina. Zadina still ended up playing over 15 minutes that game. He didn't have his power play duties taken away. And frankly, uh, Sam Gagne and Carter Rowney were leaned on more that game. So I agree. I, I don't think it's I, – I think Blashill is saying to Zadina, Zadina, you need to get it going. Let's mix things up. But I don't think it was, you know, the beatings are going to continue until morale imp- improves. I don't think it was that at all. I think it was, hey, you need to get it going. Let's mix things up. I know this isn't the, us- u- the usual situation. I'm gonna, this is where we're going to put you this game. You'll still have your power play time, et cetera. Go out there, give it 100. Let's just see what comes up. I don't know that it'll stick for a long time. I thought Zadina played well. I thought that line was fine. He had the absolute prototypical Philip Zadina game. He played very well, had like created three or four golden chances for himself and fired every one of them straight into the goalie. Yeah, yeah. It was the prototypical Satina game. He had, he also had a really good move where, same as Raymond, it was a quick uh, change of the angle, pull the puck in, use the defender as a screen, but like you said, right into the chest. Yeah. I I don't I, – I have no qualms with, with Blasio doing it. Would I have done it? No, just because I think he's much my, much less likely to score – uh, with Gagne and Rowney, but also hockey's stupid, right? It's irrational. Nothing makes sense. It would have not surprised me at all for Zadina to go out there and score a hat trick with those guys. You know, Sam Gagne plays like he did when he was a rookie, and Carter Rowney is all of a sudden a 20 point guy in the league. Like, th- that's just the kind of bullshit that would happen. You touched on something there, Brad, though, that I think is worth exploring as a concept. And I don't want to get too in the weeds on this. Because it's pure speculation. It's nothing other than speculation. But Philip Zadina has been asked to be a 200-foot player. Near every Red Wing who's on this team has been asked to be a 200-foot player. And that's not just a Jeff Blaschel thing. That's a Steve Eisman thing. That's how he wants to build this team. Okay, that's well and good. And Zadina was never deficient in his own zone or through the neutral zone. He was actually drafted in and was always known as to be quite good at those things. Um, but it wasn't the hallmark of his game, and it wasn't why he was drafted so high. Is there a conversation to be had here to say, okay, you're asking Zadina to be a 200-foot player, and he's doing it well, but it's coming somehow, some way at the expense of his scoring touch? I know it's not a zero-sum game like that. Like You can improve parts of your game and still be good at what you should be good at, and Zadina should be better at scoring. Like He has the yips right now. He's clutching his stick too tight, however you want to say it, but... Is there a conversation of he needs to be allowed to just focus only on offense? No, because it's not hindering his offense. Because if he was... How rational. How annoying. Ryan just does this like yeah. massive like build yeah. up and Brad's like, no. No, but no. Brad's right. I'll, go ahead. Yeah, it's... If he was getting one shot a game and it was some perimeter shot from the half wall, okay, then yeah, that's probably worth exploring because he's not generating offense. This guy's walking away with three or four scoring chances every game, and most of which he's creating himself. Uh, A lot of the time off turnovers and through the neutral zone because he's good at that. 
Um, and then, yeah, he gets in. He like the play you were referencing was the perfect example. Uh, great, pu- great entry, great puck control, great move, great look for a shot and just missed it. But that's the Philip Zadina experience the last year and a half. It's like, wow, wow, wow. Oh, <laughs> there are many times where I have to look again, like do a double take. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's Philip Zadina because it just like he makes like such good plays and like he's so talented and then he just can't finish. <laughs> it's just it's like he's got 95 percent. But that last five percent right now is the most important part of hockey and that's scoring goals. It's important also to remember that this isn't an exceptionally long streak of not being able to score. Think back to Johan Franzen, who I am not comparing Philip Zadina to. Johan Franzen scored much more proficiently. So let's just, for the angry comments, just hit delete. That's not what we're doing today. Um, but Franzen was streaky. He was all hot or all cold. It was feast or famine with him. We're talking about Zadina night in and night out, and we're looking at him game in and game out. If by the end of the season he's scoring at a 20-goal pace or a 30-goal pace or whatever, this is going to seem like not moot point, but you're like, okay, that was the path to get here. It's worth it. So just because we're talking about it a lot, I think it's important to remember perspective in terms of like time here. This isn't a he needs to figure this out within three games or he give up on him. No, that is a mistake that a lot of fans, GMs, coaches, organizations make, period. If you were to give up on a player as they were kind of figuring their game out, Toronto would have given up on Willie Nylander a long time ago, and they would have had exactly zero good players to start the season. So, anyways, it was a good game from him. I thought that line was good overall. It's got to come eventually, and the reason it's so frustrating is not because we know we're like deep down we know has we have he has the talent. It's like we've seen it, we've watched it. He's put goals in at that pace before. It's not like he can't shoot. Like when yeah, you watch shoot. the manic mechanics of his shot, it's incredible. Like he has a his release is incredible. It's just not going in. Uh, you know what? But I guess like at the end of the day, like I think because the Red Wings have had success this year, people's expectations have kind of you know sh- are now misaligned. Like this is still a team that's trying to rebuild and trying to get to a contender status, like <laughs> over five hundred. <laughs> keep up so it, like <laughs> Philip Zadina not scoring isn't the end of the world it it becomes a problem when I mean if he's still playing a full 200 foot game but the only thing is he's not scoring when the Red Wings are a playoff team like it's not still not the end of the world like as long as some people are contributing it's not that bad but for a guy who's built on scoring like when the Red Wings are good I would hope that's when it could become a problem perfectly put it's not great right now. Like you want him to be able to get that last five percent, but it's not burning the team. Our whole and, expectations for this year was everyone gets better and the rookies become good rookies. Yeah. Well, and it turns out the rookies becoming good happen first. They're the best <laughs> players on the team. <laughs> yeah. If if we if this is and I don't think this is true, but if this is Zadina's, you know, final form, I do not think that is true. Um, then yeah, you have a, a good third liner and a guy who can slot in on the power play. And that's great. It's just that, you know, who Philip Zadina is, where he was drafted, what he has done before and the talents that he holds. So you're like, yeah, no, you should be more than that. It's a funny experience watching a guy play really good hockey and still saying something needs to change, but it does. I'd rather him be this way than scoring goals and terrible at everything else oh yeah yeah because being a one-trick pony in the nhl is a quick way to not be there anymore yeah when verona comes back i genuinely think that if it hasn't been solved by then that'll be a good catalyst it's either going to bump him down the lineup take the pressure off or he's going to play with verona and they had really good chemistry in the past something's got to change and and like you said evan happier that it's happening now rather than when the wings are pushing for a playoff spot that's when it becomes an issue because yeah. everything becomes magnified and that's when you have expectations. I'm I'm just a little confused here. I got to double check the standings, but I thought they were push, pushing for a play. But <laughs> no, I, I, I looked this morning. Uh, I mean, they're, they're in ninth. They're uh they're one point out of a playoff spot, Ryan. So uh, I will not have one, this two, negativity three. at three. eight in the morning. They are in terms of the four teams outside of the two wild card spots. They are fourth. 
behind in points percentage behind Boston. Listen, I'm not here for your logic and <laughs> rationale. Okay. Boston, Montreal, the Islanders, and Ottawa. The Islanders, oh boy. Waited all well, that time to play their home games. I think a lot of people got their uh, pre preseason predictions wrong. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I hate to be them. <laughs> <laughs> Idiots. <laughs> Before we jump into the rest of the league, uh, I am going to mention to you that this episode of the Winged Wheel podcast is proudly brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook, uh, a sponsor that we're thrilled to work with because they are giving us uh, what we want even more excited with the game of, excitement with the game of hockey. There's a lot of reasons they're America's number one sports book. Uh, they're simple to use. They have tons of fun and unique bet types. And when you win, you get your winnings safely back to you in as little as 24 hours. Uh, the quick withdrawals are a huge bonus, but at also are the odds boosts and specials every day. Uh, something's coming through and there's some big super boosts each weekend. Now listen to this. FanDuel is letting you place your first bet risk-free up to $1,000. Place a bet on any game, and FanDuel will refund you up to $1,000 back in site credit if you don't win. And if you do, you keep the cash. Uh, what you have to do now is download the FanDuel Sportsbook app to get started with a risk-free bet of up to $1,000. And be sure to sign up with promo code WWP so they know we sent you. That's FanDuel Sportsbook promo code WWP. You must be 21 and older and present in, present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, West Virginia, Indiana, Colorado, Iowa, Tennessee, Virginia, or Michigan. First online real money wager only. Site credit is non-withdrawable and expires in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See sportsbook.fanduel.com for details. If you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado. 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana. 1-800-GAMBLER in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, or Virginia. Tennessee Redline 1-800-889-9789 or 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia and 1-800-270-7117 in Michigan. Okay. So Michigan. that's... Oh, that's right. Michigan. 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 <laughs> Michigan. I've always believed. I <laughs> no, never you have. I've never once thought that a game against Ohio State would be an automatic loss. Not once in my life. And I would never lie about that. <laughs> I have to tell you, I didn't believe it literally until the score clock ran down to zero. I know. I was watching the uh, fourth quarter. And, and Crystal, she loves football, but she's never watched a college football game in her life. Um, and she's like, I'm like losing it with like two minutes left. And she's like, they're up by 15 with two minutes left. You can calm down. I'm like, no, no. you you must be new here. No, <laughs> no, no, no. I just had flashbacks <laughs> of the MSU game in my yeah, mind. I'm like, I'm like, no, 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 no. And then she's like, why are you like, she's like, you watch like four, maybe five Michigan games a year. Why are you like so into this? I'm like, you don't understand. <laughs> like, hey, it's been a decade. They haven't beat this team. And she's like, oh, so like Ohio State's a rival? I'm like, no, this is the biggest rivalry in sports. This is like Yankees, Red Sox type shit. Ohio and State is like, <clears throat> all right, there's there's world war and there's, you know, whatever country versus whatever country and they're enemies for life. That's Michigan and MSU. And then the aliens invade and it's like this horrific force and all the earth needs to band together to beat them. That's Ohio State. I would my, I will take an MSU win over an over an Ohio State win any day of my life. Oh, a thousand percent, a thousand percent. And then she's like, "Oh, so like, does the game mean anything?" I'm like, "Ohio State's two in the country, Michigan's five. This game means everything." And so she's like, she was having more fun watching me than watching the actual game. Yeah, <laughs> it was uh, it was very hard to not use hail. To the victors as the uh, intro for this segment. <laughs> um, well, you're not singing on a Sunday morning. <laughs> the the meme that sent that got sent actually a lot of them got sent our way, but one of them was like that guy cheering and celebrating with a medal on the podium. And then it zooms out; he's actually like tenth on the podium. <laughs> he sent that, and it was like Ohio State all the way down. Yeah, I didn't see that. <laughs> Michigan at the bottom. I was like, you have to understand. We know, and we do not give a shit. <laughs> One of us is going to the college football playoff this year, and that's all that I care about this year. Did it take a decade longer than you'd have hoped? Yeah. Has it been painful this entire time? Yeah. Was the wait worth it? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> and was I happier? Oh, man. Just what a day for sports. A great day for sports. Um, to the OSU fans who are listening and are like, wow, these guys are being assholes. Um, I'd like to apologize to absolutely nobody because you have been relentless. <laughs> you have been relentless since we've started this podcast. We have this one and we are taking advantage of it. This is 
the first Michigan over Ohio State win in the history of this podcast. Oh, my God. <laughs> Let us have it. So, um, in conclusion, go blue. Yeah, what was it? Michigan won in football and hockey yesterday. Michigan State won in football and the Red Wings won yesterday. Yeah. What a great day for the state of Michigan. Yeah. And uh, Liverpool. Don't care. (laughs) (laughs) Um, If you're going on about Liverpool, I'm going back to Thanksgiving Day. uh, Yeah. No, we won't be doing that. (laughs) What's with his turnovers, man? Don't actually answer, but his turnovers are annoying. It's not Josh Allen. He gets like a three-game streak like that every year. Uh, So the Detroit Red Wings coming up have the Boston Bruins on the 30th and then our home to the Seattle Kraken on uh, Wednesday, December 1st. Man, it is already December. Holy shit. It's crazy. Uh, Detroit, like we mentioned, is just barely outside of a playoff spot right now. But in terms of point points percentage, they're lower down. Um, mm-hmm. It's fine. Yeah. It's because the Red Wings have already played half their games this year. League and leaders. Boston, Boston's yeah. played 12. Something like that. Yeah. Um, so the that was the Carter Rowney goal, which was originally the Zadina got switched, and then the Pew Suter goal, and then Lucas Raymond, and that was scoring. Larkin's on like a, what is it, seven game point streak? Yep. Man, who are going to be the Red Wings All Stars? Lucas Raymond and Mo Sider and Dylan Larkin and Tyler Bertuzzi and Alex Ndelkovic. I mean, they're going to have a few. They're going to have to have a Red Wings specific All Star game. Where is the All Star game this year? Do we know? All Star games in Vegas. Uh, the Red Wings are going to have to send their jet just full of the team to go. They're going to need to do a five on five, like get rid of this three on three, go back to five on five, just so we can have a Red Wings line. Oh my God, we're going to be upset about Red Wings being snubbed at the All Star game. Yeah, because like no team ever gets more than like two. Yeah, like if you had to pick two Red Wings right now, like you, they're going to send the kids for the show, of course. But well, like you can't not send Larkin. You can't not send Larkin. Like, but and you really shouldn't not send Bertuzzi either. He's been cold enough lately. You could justify it. If we're looking at the full body of the season, then yeah, he should be. But, you know, the NHL is a what have you done for me lately type league. So given the way everything's trending, if the Red Wings do only get two, which is going to be one more than they usually get, it's probably Raymond and Larkin, which would be like we would complain all year about Cider, rightfully so. If I know anything about the All-Star game and how little most players want to go, I feel like they should send the rookies more so as like, you know, paying your dues yeah. and because it would be a good experience for them like Dylan Larkin gains virtually nothing from going to an all-star weekend whereas Cider and Raymond like that is a crazy like I'm sure this year is already crazy enough for them make playing in the NHL full-time but going to an all-star game and being with the guys that they grew up watching and they can talk to and you know pick their brains like it'd be invaluable Dylan Larkin's doing a Zoom call talking about his disappointment and not being invited to the All-Star game from a beach in the Mayan Riviera. He's got, that, he's got that fake background. Everyone puts on like they're in the office. Like this would be like the Red Wings locker room fake background. Uh, okay, some quick news from around the league. Um, Brendan Lemieux bit. Uh, what's it called? Brady Kachuk? And do they, if... If what Brady was showing on his hand is to be believed as a result of the bite, which was immediately after the fight. So, uh, yeah, the part that concerned me was that there was a blood, like he drew blood. Oh, yeah. This is an actual hazard. And the only thing that makes us kind of less bad is if it wasn't if that was blood from Lemieux's mouth from being punched in the face by Kachuk. And that that is a possibility. You still shouldn't bite a guy or rub your blood on him weird stuff on this podcast um he bit him apparently more than once he's got priors he's been suspended before he's got previous incidents i think i don't know it's brennan lemieux um it's got to be a long suspension right you can't have that in the league spin the wheel if it's not five games or more i'm Okay, my immediate gut reaction is i'm not even saying this to be funny is maximum allowable fine like the i I get that vibe with this, which is crazy. I know, but that's just how much faith I've lost in this system because yeah, you bit a guy. Like you you're the you you're the guy who went to college here for the medical stuff. Um 
And your first words were like, oh, yeah, no, if that's uh, Kachuk's blood, like before we start recording, like this is like he's going through a battery of tests and antibiotics. and like, Yeah, it's nasty. You don't want <laughs> – yeah, uh, bacteria from a human's mouth is really, really bad for infections. Like, And there were cases in hockey before. There was something a while back where a guy had a cut from a fight. Like he, his knuckle grazed a guy's tooth or whatever it was. And he played through it, and he nearly lost his hand from the infection. Was it a Nick Antropov? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I'll look it up. But – it's common. Yeah. Like you, you really do not want to mess around with bacteria from a, a human's mouth. And, you're... and that's just like a normal instance. We don't know if like there's a one in a million chance here that like Lemieux's got something that he could give to Kachuk that would, you know, be real bad. It's French. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's a world of concern here. So, yeah, this should be a massive fine because there's a lot of things that happen in the NHL. Like when we absolutely dump on Tom Wilson for throwing a bad hit where a guy was cutting across the middle, Tom Wilson at least gets a little bit of the benefit of the doubt of he might've been going for an actual hit. It was reactionary. He didn't have a lot of time to process it. Okay. It's all like weak arguments, but at least it's an argument. Every adult in the world knows to not bite someone and there's nothing timing or reactionary related to a bite. This was Brendan Lemieux going, ha, screw this guy. There's his hand. Um, num, num. So, yeah, there's he's got no leg to stand on. It's only an argument of severity. Uh, the argument will be he he was punching me in the face and he shoved his hand in my face and I had to get it out. That's how it always goes. But still not an excuse. <sighs> Kind of gross. It's, it's so gross, man. Just pull the marsh hand at that point. He'll pull his hand away pretty quickly. Oh, that wasn't looked on with as much disdain as it should have been, by the way. The no, it hand absolutely looked. wasn't. Yeah. That was gross. It was vile. Hockey players are so What line do you think Brendan will, me will play on in Boston? <laughs> With Marchand? Yeah, Probably. definitely. No, he's not. He's Brendan Lemieux, when you actually look at his, he's he's a terrible, terrible NHL hockey player. They're starting a new band, those two. Their, their band's called Kiss. <laughs> No. Yeah, I heard that name hasn't been used before. No. <laughs> I have an idea for a logo. <laughs> um, and speaking of fines, Artemi Panarin and Brad Marchand arguing between the benches was funny enough as is. And then Panarin taking his glove and whipping it at Marchand and getting five, fined five grand for it was even funnier. Yep. Apparently, I think, um, what was it? Marchand said something about Russia that was like cross the line for Panarin. And that's what caused him to throw the glove. I'm like, hey, whatever you cross the line with, sure, your standards are your standards. You should have thrown both gloves. <laughs> you legitimately <laughs> should have. What did McKinnon get for throwing that helmet? He got a one or a two game suspension. Ah, uh, yeah, you don't want to get. You can spear a guy in the balls, but yeah, heaven yeah. forbid for five thousand bucks. But heaven forbid someone throws a soft glove at someone. Yeah, with his off hand. Yeah, if I threw <laughs> anything with my left arm, you'd be wondering what's wrong with me. Can, yeah, can center we, ice. Yeah. Can we point out that was a really damn good throw for his was off bad. hand? Yeah. Like, I mine would have not been that good. I'd have probably hit the defenseman five players down. Into the yeah. f- into the seventh row of the stands. <laughs> I'm left-handed and I wouldn't have thrown it that well. <laughs> um, That was funny, though. I It reminded me of um, the Red Wings. Who was it? The Red Wings and the Avalanche, was it? Where there was like a, someone dropped a glove or a stick between a the stick, benches. Yeah. And they stole it. <laughs> Warren, Warren Reichel and then Maltby Draper. And I want to say it was Primo were involved in stealing it back. I remember it so well. It's <laughs> so funny, man. Give me more of this. Yeah. Put the benches closer together, honestly. But my favorite thought in all of this is just how stupid the NHL is. It's like Panarin gets fined. He's dealing with Martian. And I'm sitting here going, isn't this the entire reason the Rangers got Ryan Reeves this offseason? Yeah. Like... Panarin should just look down the bench. Revo, 63. Okay. Well, I mean, he's too busy with those filthy dangles. I know. <laughs> he gets to New York and he turns into an actual hockey player now. The the narrative has changed. It's Broadway, baby. It changes people. Um, okay. Overtime. Should we get into overtime? Sure. Overtime on this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast uh, is brought to you by Patreon supporters. Patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast if you want to become one of the incredible people to support this show. Uh, and in case this is your first time tuning in in a while, we've changed overtime. We're going to take a few of the questions to discuss on the episode. Uh, ones with interesting questions or so- just something that we feel like talking about. And then 
Uh, we answer all of the rest of the questions um, in a Patreon exclusive overtime recording that's released uh, soon after the episode. So uh, everyone's questions are still going to get answered and discussed um, and patrons get to hear the whole thing as our way of saying thanks. Okay, we are going to start with Aaron Hudson, who brings back what was one of the most contentious topics apparently we've had in a little while. Should the Red Wings tra- uh, trade for Gerard? So that's something that we talked about a few episodes ago. I think just before actually the Winged Wheel podcast night. Um, and people had a lot of differing opinions. We've slept on it for a while. What do you think? Uh, after talking to a bunch of people around the league and realizing that um, when I said the asking price would be Bertuzzi and people saying, oh, that wouldn't be enough. Uh, no. If that's where we're at with the asking price. No. No. Although there's merit to the conversation of do you eventually move Bertuzzi while he's performing at his the best he has ever in his career. Then there's also merit there's to the conversation. That other, there's that other thing. Where can you necessarily trade him at peak value right now? It all comes down to the the bullshit cop out answer of for the right price, yeah. Yeah, for for the right price, you move everybody. There's nobody in the NHL other than Connor McDavid that should be untouchable. That's just the reality of the world we live in. Um but yeah, now would be a great time to move Bertuzzi if it weren't for the thing. Um, Sam Gerard would be great to have, but he's kind of one of those guys you want to buy low on. Like, like if, if Sackick were a worse GM with the kind of funk Gerard has been in, this would be the right time, but Sackick's not a dummy and he's crazy patient. So you're not getting that type of deal out of Joe Sackick. He's almost, he almost has Eisman level patience. As yeah. GM. It's well, let's not forget the Duchesne thing, man. People were calling for his head, how long it took him to make that trade and it turned out to be one of the best trades in franchise history. So I think we were calling for his head because we were annoyed that it was dragging. So yeah, long. honestly. So it's not going to happen with Gerard. If you're comfortable with giving up Bertuzzi and a premium prospect for him. Okay. That's what you're going to have to do. I'm not willing to do that for Sam Gerard. So right now my, my mindset at no, if the Red Wings were like starving for left-handed defensemen, you maybe pay premium, but with, between Edmondson, Wallander, Johansson, Sabrango, Vero, like there's options now. They're not all going to pan out and they're not all going to be as good as Sam Gerard, but there's options. So if you can, if Albert Johansson turns into 75% of Sam Gerard, but you have that 75% of him plus Tyler Bertuzzi, that's still a net win. Yeah. You're just looking at basic assets there. Yeah. A concept that is, I I understand it's risky and it doesn't always play out, but that whole buy low thing, it's so important in dealing in the NHL because if you're just paying for guys at their peak, you're either paying a shit ton of money or a ton of assets and then there is still some inherent risk. Situations like Gerard or situations like Robbie Fabry, that's one that actually has panned out for Detroit. That's where you get the real, real value. They're hard to find. They're even harder to pull off because if you if you can identify something as a market inefficiency, so is everyone else, right? So you have 30 other GMs trying to do the same thing. And it's harder, too, when you're doing NHL player for NHL player swaps because if you're looking at Bertuzzi and Gerard, let's just assume it's a one-for-one one trade and they're equivalent value. Yeah. You're not making your team better. You're solving one problem while creating another. And the Red Wings aren't deep enough at any one position to be able to take someone off the roster and go, oh, we don't have a hole there now. So you take Bertuzzi off that top line, but now you've got Sam Gerard on the left D. Well, now you have another huge problem to solve, even though you solved another problem. It's it's why the Fabry trade, trades like that are, are so rare. Sorry, Kara, cover your ears, but... They traded one for one roster player for roster player, and the Red Wings just happened to get a much better roster player. So they actually improved their team significantly through that trade. That wouldn't happen here. And especially if the trade has to give up an extra on top of that, that's, that's why you see more picks and prospects for players because teams are willing to gamble. They're like, okay, we're not good now. So if we make this trade, it doesn't work out. Who cares? It doesn't affect our season or our next couple seasons at all. But there's the reality we win this trade because the, assets we acquired are 
overall more valuable than what we gave up. Like we all hated the Eric Carlson trade for Ottawa when they made it. Yeah. Well, they, they, they won that trade running away. They got Stutzla out of that and they got a bunch and Norris out of that. They got a bunch of pieces out of that. Like that, that trade turned to be a grand slam just because you don't know what happens on those. It's, it's rolling the dice, but on a player for player. Yeah. You better be damn sure. Or you better have an absolute surplus at whatever position you're trading. And the Red Wings don't have that. Uh, Who's your dad? Noff asks comrades. What are the chances we'll see Nedeljkovic Kosa as a tandem next year? Next year, low, very low. I think they'll still like for a couple games on a recall. Sure, maybe because Kosa has been great. Yeah, I think they'll still probably give him the chance to work through the AHL if they were desperate. You know, if this was a team that was ready for a playoff spot, but they didn't, they weren't graced with Nedeljkovic. Uh, and Grice wasn't holding the, the tandem up. And they had no cap space where they needed an ELC in there. They That would be cause to rush them even further. But, you know, Kosa, one year in junior, one year in the A, and then the Red Wings thereafter, that's still a fast path for a goalie. So, it's a remarkably fast pass path I won't for say, a goalie. I won't say very low. I'll say lower than 50% for sure. I think. Oh, I'm going like under 15. Yeah, I think that's closer to where it's at. Yeah. If you had to assign a number to it. Um, Mike Caviani says, have you had a chance to watch any of Svechnikov's game with Winnipeg? seems like he's found regular playing time and they seem to appreciate him there. I hope it continues to work for him. It's a good fit. Yep. Yep. Uh, the reminder that Eiserman is the best GM in the league, but not completely infallible. <sighs> Svechnikov wasn't lights out in Detroit. I, is this a change? It's a change. Like he's playing better there than he ever did in Detroit. But he didn't play bad here. I will argue that till the day I die. He was not bad here. He wasn't. He was a good third liner here. Okay, straight up question. Uh, third line left wing. Who would you rather have right now? Evgeny Svechnikov or Michael Rasmussen? Oh, okay. Well, I think Michael Rasmussen should be the fourth line center. So, <laughs> Well, he's playing on the third line. So, <sighs> I get it. He wasn't young, right? Like Svechnikov has not exactly... He's had a, a, a crummy path through the NHL, uh, and they lost a lot of really valuable years with it, with him. They they made a calculation. Well, he's 25, but they made a calculation to say this guy is still going through that like developmental phase. Red Wings roster forward roster spots aren't exactly as plentiful as they have been in the past. Do I like him over every single, or do I like every single Red Wings forward over him on this roster? No, not necessarily. I think this is a change of scenery thing. He was never going to get top six him. minutes in Detroit, right? No. And that's what he's getting in, in Winnipeg by virtue yeah. of them needing to fill that spot. Yeah. So, I don't know. Would he have unlocked this this year? I don't think playing on a line with with Ernie or Rasmussen or whoever he would have been with, he wouldn't have been on the second line. No, he's getting way more help in Winnipeg, that's for sure. It's so, better for Svechnikov. Yeah. I don't think it, I don't think you're necessarily wrong, Brad, in that the Red Wings maybe gave up on him, like in a vacuum too early. I just don't see a, I, I just don't see a way this would have happened in Detroit. Plus, he's having fun out there. You see, it the reminds video? him of he's, the homeland. He's, yeah, he's the meme king. <laughs> he seriously is. It's like uh, the tundra of Winnipeg, <laughs> although Russia has airports. Um, all right, Cody Stark says, "Boys, Cooper Moore is really stepping it up in note at Nodak. Uh, he's maybe not showing on the score sheet, but he's buzzing on the second pairing as a, and as a QB on power play too. I've been watching a lot now that I'm a sexy ice shovel boy. I love the videos of uh, <laughs> Cody sends us the videos of him uh, doing the scrapes between uh, between whistles. Yeah, Cooper Moore is a is a is a guy that um, I remember the Red Wings." scouts or u.s scouts really bang the table for him uh they were impressed with what he did in high school so it's good to know that, good to know that he's doing well in no deck so much depth that left-handed defenseman all-star like you know star level this guy could potentially become a superstar they have exactly one guy but there's a bunch of decent players underneath mm -hmm. who is it donovan sabrango is doing real well weird Real weird. Nobody could have seen that coming. Who was arguing? Who was on the other side of this? I mean, I was one of the very few guys oh, who had him second God, round. Just geez. saying. Oh, here we go. That's my boy. Old man That's shakes my fist boy. Uh, 
Brian Burr says a big day for teams in the mitten with the Olympic jerseys starting to be revealed. Who on the team outside of Cider could be picked for their Olympic team? Oh, oh man, the, more than you would think. Uh, Zadina, Hironik, and Veron. Well, Verona's not going to be healthy. Zadina and Hironik are locks for the Czech Republic. Larkin's a lock for the States. Yeah. Has to be. Um, what other weird? S- Lucas Raymond for Sweden, quite obviously. Yeah, he'll get a long, long look there. No, they got to pick him. There's no way they don't pick him. I'll look and most him projections much. I've seen for Sweden. Sweden don't always goes veteran heavy. Yeah, they'd be it. They'd, they'd be he'll wrong. get a look yeah. for sure. He'll be what is it? Fifty five players are the initial list. Um, and they start whittling it down. Yeah, Nemesnikov for Russia. Yeah, yeah. If the U.S. didn't have eighteen thousand top tier goalies, Alex Delkovic should get a look too. No, oh, yeah, but he's not even getting considered. No, it's Demko and Campbell for that last spot. The U.S. Yeah, even Spencer Knight may not even. Get a good sniff. Oh, he's not even in consideration. No. Yeah, there's no way. The U.S. love to do, like, uh, they always love to have the next crop sort of looming in the shadows. That's the only reason why I think he might, like, he won't, I don't think he'll make the team, but he'll definitely be somewhere in the mix of the 55. Well, the two locks for the U.S.'s net are going to be Gibson and Hellebuck. Yeah. And it's probably Demko and Campbell for the last two, and I bet. Or the last spot, and I bet Demko gets it. So we have Larkin, Raymond, Sider, Nemesnikov, Hronik, Zadina are the most likely candidates. Suter. Is the Swiss in it? Yeah, they're in it. Yeah, Suter for the Swiss. Yeah. Um, and then you have two former Red Wings playing for China. <laughs> Wait, Who? actually? Uh yeah, you didn't see Sproul and um Oh my god. What? Sproul and Jake Chelios have been uh, lacing up for the Chinese team as they've been going through not warm-ups, basically them evaluating whether China's good enough to even play in the Olympics. But yeah. Yep. They got citizenship. Like how I like know. I know Nigel Dawes is the captain of Kazakhstan. So like we're like I understand the rules are weird, but that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Jake Chelios and Ryan Sproul, part of the Chinese Olympic uh, hockey team trials or whatever it is. Wow. What a ride. They're, um, it's not about citizenship necessarily. It's complicated, and they're going to have to make some exceptions for for the Chinese team. I, I don't even know if they're going to play, honestly, the Chinese team. like They're going to just get – we talked about it before on this podcast, but they're going to get absolutely demolished. If you just throw Connor McDavid and Carey Price out there, does Canada still beat China? I'm going to say yes. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, anyways. Uh, on that note, we're going to wrap up this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. Thank you all so much for listening. We'd like to thank all of our listeners, uh, our name level sponsors, Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels, on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, uh, Kyle Karagitz, Nick Perks, Taylor Tagel, Matthew M. Rice, Brandon M., Carl Bertin and Analuski, Chimmy, Citizen High Five, CJ Sully, Clayton Van Dyken, Craig Kibble, Creeping on That Booty, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Give Blood Fight, Probert, Greech, Hana Lee, Hassam al Qasem, Jacob Turner, Jake Kiefer, Justin and the Angry Mob, Kaylin Wood, King Tone, Kyle Hashman, Matt McKay, R.A., Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Stay Fresh Cheese Bags, Shay Lobsinger's number one stand, Stacey Lynn, Zach Spring, Andrew Bohan, Sam Bankson, Adam I Wish I Could Finish Like Ernie, Antonio Gracias, Babe Landeskog, Ben Barron, Brad DeFour9, Colorado 14ers, Connor Leighton, Dave W., Eric Sinkowski, Evans Bingo Card, James Laporte, Jeremy Brocker, John Evans, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Logan Stull, Matt Keeler, Matt S., Max $1 million, Michael Alsante, Revy DeLuca, Shit and Bricklets, Terry Actual, Trevor Pevavar, Zach Handyside, and Zach McCann, a driving range superstar. Thank you all so much. We'll talk to you midweek. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.